invite you to take your Bibles and join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you do not have one, there's one in front of you in the pew. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repair, repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to, go, to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Father, may we truly do and may you grant what we just sang to behold you, that you would show your glory to all of us in the measure that we can handle this side of heaven, that there would be a holy reverence about the handling of your word that we would have a holy fear of listening to your word and that we would be quick to obey what you would instruct us. Thank you, Father, for an open Bible and thank you for your spirit, the author, his willingness to teach us and to point us to Christ. May that happen in each and every soul today for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we begin winding down our study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I, I hate to use the word study in a sense that it, make it, it makes it feel so mechanical and academic, in which it is not. Uh, this letter is a warm letter. It is a very affectionate letter. It is a personal letter. Uh, and it is a letter to a church that was dearly loved by the Apostle Paul. And it was a church that was a good church and that it modeled for us what happens when first love for Christ rules in a church. And as he winds this letter down, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, uh, he gives us a beautiful picture of what the church is to be like in its relationships. Because Christianity, in its fundamental truth, is that of relationship. And he would say in verses 12 and 13, the relationship between leaders and sheep. And then in 13 through 15, he would exhort these believers in the relationship in the church with one another. And he would move on also in verse 15, the relationships we are to have with all people in the world. And then in verses 16 through 22, he will define and describe the elements in a healthy relationship with God. So you'll see that in these last few verses, it's not just a conclusion of a letter. It's very instructive showing us the fundamental truths of spiritual relationships in the church of Jesus Christ. And what we looked at last week in verses 12 and 13 was the, uh, the relationship of leaders to sheep. And we noted that, that leaders that are respected, uh, that promote respect from the sheep, they are, she they are leaders that lead well, they labor hard, and they love thoroughly. And we're going to see today the reciprocating responsibility and privileges of sheep to their leaders. Because Paul understands the importance of harmony in the church between leaders and between sheep. And when leaders labor hard, lead well, and love thoroughly, and sheep respect leaders, honor leaders, and love leaders, there is something about that oneness that sends a powerful message into the community. There is something about the oneness of the church and its leadership and its sheep and its sheep on sheep that shows the world the reality of Jesus Christ. Conversely, when sheep and leaders are at odds, and when there's, there's this tension between leaders and sheep, three things which are devastating, 
Three things. Number one, it is a sign of corporate hypocrisy. For sheep and leaders to profess to love the Lord Jesus, but yet harbor something against each other, it is a corporate hypocrisy. Secondly, it also grieves the heart of God when there is a disunity among the sheep and the leaders. And thirdly, it confuses the world for the message that we say and the message that we live are in contradiction. The importance of this harmony between leaders and sheep and between sheep and sheep cannot be overstated. Francis Schaeffer said this, quote, we cannot expect the world to believe the Father sent the Son that Jesus' claims are true and that Christianity is true unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians, end quote. Schaefer was prophetic in many ways. But as we look at the sheep responsibilities today, because we saw last week how leaders, that if they're true leaders, whether it be under shepherds, whether it be deacons, whatever the leadership role in the church, if they're true leaders, they are going to exhaust themselves in hard labor of the gospel for the sheep. They're going to lead well by example and by immersion in the body. And they are going to love thoroughly by giving the whole counsel of God. They're going to give the hard instruction as well as the easy to receive instruction, so to speak. But what I want us to do before we look at the sheep responsibilities and privilege as they reciprocate back uh, to the leaders, I want us to look at two perspectives showing the importance of this harmony between sheep and leaders. Look at Acts chapter 2 with me. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. The strength and the witness of the early church was its oneness. Is it was their oneness that allowed them to change the world upside down. But it was a oneness that was very narrow in its unifying principles. Acts chapter 2 verse 42. As I read this description of the first church, I want you to note the oneness and the togetherness that they had. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The implication is togetherness and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came where fear came up on every soul. It wasn't isolated in the body. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and all had thing, all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It is not a justice to the text to say that the Lord granted them church growth because of their steadfast unity of one another. Is that they were committed to the four elements that guide the church and guide unity. They were committed to the apostles' doctrine. They were committed to fellowship. They were committed to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, and hospitality. And they were committed to prayer. There was a blacksmith. He had two pieces of iron. And he wanted to weld them into one. So he took them as they were, individual pieces of steel. They were all cold and hard. And he put them on his anvil. And he began pounding away, trying to make them one. And he had no success. Each piece of steel remained independent of one another and would not unite no matter how much effort the blacksmith expended. Then he remembered something that he should not have forgotten. He took each piece and thrust them into a fiery furnace. And after a short period of time, he took them out, red hot, pliable, laid them one upon another, and with a couple of blows from his hammer, they became one. The fiery furnace that makes us pliable and makes us soft clay that we can become one are the four elements that mark the healthy church. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, prayer, and the breaking of bread. And when leaders and sheep are actively participating in all four of those, then we can rest assured that God will honor his church and that we'll be well on our way of maintaining the harmony of relationships between sheep and leaders 
and between each other, and the world will take notice that we indeed have been with Jesus. And so the first principle then, or the first perspective of why this harmony between sheep and leaders is so important, and why Paul would stress this, is because the strength and the witness of the early church was founded in this unity. But I also want you to look at the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Here's the second perspective why this harmony and unity between leadership and sheep is vital for the work of the gospel is because the emphasis Jesus places upon it. Christ in his high priestly prayer, notice in verse 20 of John 17, the passionate pleas that he would have for a oneness about his people. Verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. And notice the profound illustration, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Christ is praying that his church and his people would be so one in heart, one in mind, that it represents the unity of the Trinity. What a profound sense of responsibility you should have as a believer and I should have as a believer to maintain a harmony with leaders and sheep alike based on the fact that God claims and wants us to mark the unity that he has with his son and with his spirit. He would go on and say that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. And note at the end of verse 23, the impact that unity between leaders and sheep, and sheep and sheep have in the world. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Beloved, don't underestimate the power of unity and the power of harmony between leaders and sheep, sheep and leaders, sheep and sheep. And also don't underestimate the destructive power when disunity occurs. And so Paul would, would exhort these Thessalonians. They were not in disunity. But he was keenly aware of the fallen nature of men and women. He's keenly aware that we're only one disagreement away from allowing a fostering of disunity. We're only one step away from tarnishing the witness of the, of the gospel through our disunity. Last week, we looked at the under-shepherds worthy of respect by sheep. As I mentioned, uh, they labor hard. They labor hard in prayer and the word. We also see that they lead well by example as well as protectors of the flock. And they love thoroughly. Now, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to look at sheep. What's the responsibilities of sheep to their leaders? Now, the first thing we need to establish, if you're here today, is that this will only apply to you is if you're a sheep. Is that you have to be in the pasture in order for this to apply to you. So if you've come today and you're not a Christian and you have not come to that point where you understand that you need to be reconciled to your God, that you don't know the God that we are going to talk about, then today is your day to become the sheep of his pasture. And there's only one way to do that, and that is by the gospel. Is the gospel of Jesus Christ takes rebels and makes them children, takes enemies and makes them friends. And so I would urge you today, if you've come here and you're a religious person, you can be a religious person, not a sheep. As you need to come, you need to understand that to apply this in the sheep-sheep relationship, in the sheep-to-leader relationship, you must be a sheep. And that means you must have experienced the repentance and the faith in Jesus Christ that leads to new birth. It is the gospel that allows us to maintain harmony. It is the gospel that allows us to be unified. There is nothing in the church of Jesus Christ in relationships with each other that cannot be overcome and cannot be healed uh, without the, with the gospel. The gospel does that work. It is the gospel. So if you're not a Christian today, run to the gospel. Run to Christ and be able to walk out of here saying, as we sang, the Lord is my shepherd. And he stands ready to be your shepherd and invites you into the flock. 
Run to him. Flee to him right now. Cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you'll find yourself walking out of here with new life, new direction, new purpose, and a new relationship with the creator who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. And that is how you become a sheep. Well, what is a sheep responsibility to leaders? Now, I emphasize that on the gospel because, unfortunately, there are times that sheep and leaders and sheep and sheep don't get along, and there's polarized relationships. And you know why it's polarized? Because the gospel is not applied in those relationships. The gospel reconciles everything. If, if the gospel can reconcile me to my God when I was eternally separated from him, cannot the gospel reconcile horizontal relationships between sheep and sheep? It's the forgetting this of the gospel. It is forgetting the application of Christ's love that causes us to bring tarnish in our relationships as sheep to sheep, uh, sheep to leaders, and leaders to sheep. But today, let's take a look, because this is, this is not a negative message. This is... The, Paul's instruction is very positive. He's showing us that this is the type of leaders who are worthy of respect. They labor hard, they lead well, and they love thoroughly. And because of that, the sheep welcome the relationship. The sheep understand their responsibilities to their leaders. Let's take a look. We're going to look at three of them. And if you have an outline, you can follow along. If not, you can get one on your way out. It may help you for further study. We're going to look at three things by way of the sheep responsibility to leaders. The first one is, what is required of sheep towards your leaders? Secondly, how are sheep to respect and esteem their leaders? And thirdly, why are sheep to do this? So the what question, the how question, and the why question. Verse 12, what is required of sheep towards their leaders? Paul would say, we ask you, brothers, and in the original, it adds sisters, we ask you, brothers, we ask you, he could say, we ask you, church, to respect or appreciate those who labor among you. So the first requirement of a sheep to a leader is to show appreciation. Now, we need to be careful with that. This isn't some vague sense of respect, This isn't a sheep at a distance, just acknowledging respect to a leader. Far more than that. This is not what Paul's exhorting. The word respect or appreciate, it means to know by experience. Basically what Paul is saying to these Thessalonians is that you need to know your leaders. You need to be close to your leaders. You need to have an appreciation for them because you know them. Paul's call to the Thessalonians isn't just to stand at a distance and say, yeah, that's, he's a nice guy. Or yeah, they're nice men. This is not a call to niceness. This is a call to depth in relationship. As credible leadership immerses themselves in the lives of sheep, the sheep do likewise with their leaders. In a healthy church, leaders know the sheep, and sheep know their leaders. And this occurs by togetherness. It occurs by an intentional spiritual commitment as family to know one another. Because the more that you know your leader as a sheep, the more that you'll have an appreciation for what the leader's called to do. But if you stand at a distance and you don't know your leaders, you know what it's easy to do? It's easy to have, it's easy to have critical spirits towards a leader. It's easy to go home at noon and have preacher for lunch. It's easy to be critical to a leader if you're at a distance and all you're doing is looking at them instead of knowing them. And Paul is saying Respect them because you know them. Because you know them. J. Lanier Burns said this in a wonderful book. He wrote a book called Pride and Humility at War with One Another. He says, quote, according to the Bible, the church is a family where artificial distinctions, and I would add individualism and privatization, are melted by God's grace and a common bond in Christ. 
Now think about that. He says, according to the Bible, the church, sheep, sheep, sheep leaders, is a family where artificiality is melted by God's grace in a common bond in Christ. Don't you long for such? Don't you long to be in a place where biblical Christianity is not just preached and talked, but lived? Where you can be real? Where with all your fumblings and bumblings and stumblings and warts and bruises and failings, you can come as you are, knowing that you're going to meet with other people just as they are, and we're going to be loving to one another because of the gospel? This is what Paul is affirming. He's saying, know these leaders, invest in them. Know them so when the time gets hard, you won't jettison the family because you don't like something. That happens all too easily. What the church of Jesus Christ needs today is a recover of authentic Christianity. A Christianity that is rooted in transparency. That's rooted in vulnerability. That's rooted in the scripture shaping our lives so that we immerse ourselves in each other's lives. What did the early church do in Acts 2? They were so inter- interwoven in each other's lives that the Lord honored such a thing and he added daily those who were being saved. And everywhere they went, they took notice that they had been with Jesus because of their togetherness because of their oneness. The church of Jesus Christ needs revived today to understand what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. And that is a family, a family, a spiritual family that's not afraid to be transparent, that's not afraid to be vulnerable, that is willing to take the risk of commitment to one another through the ups and downs and the thickness of life. The Apostle Paul was not afraid to be transparent. Read his letters. Look how transparent he was to the Corinthians, a church that turned on him. Paul says, I come to you in weakness. I come to you feeble. And I come to you, though you love me less, I will love you more. Very transparent to the Corinthians. How about his transparency with Timothy? The strong Christian that Paul was, the pillar of the faith, he told Timothy, he says, I was the chief of sinners. And what about his transparency with Philemon? He said, oh, brother, beloved, you have refreshed my soul. I long to be with you. And what about Paul with the Thessalonians? Do you get my drift? Everywhere Paul went, he was not afraid or full of pride. He was willing to be real. And we have to do that. We have to be willing to be real as sheep and willing to be real, to show appreciation, to know one another. And the greatest challenge that you and I will face in order to be real, in order to show this respect and this appreciation that we're required to do to one another, the greatest challenge you you face will be your intentionality of time to know one another. The two greatest things you have to offer someone in your life is yourself and your time. Those are the two greatest things that you offer. And if there's going to be authenticity in the church of Jesus Christ, then those two things is what you have to be willing to give. You will not and I will not be a sheep and a leader that God wants me to have if I'm at a distance and I don't know you and you're at a distance and you don't know me. Because the more that we get to know with one another, the more that we're going to appreciate one another. And the wonderful diversity that God has given his church. And the wonderful giftedness that we all have as we come together and we flesh out this thing called Christianity. As modeled in the scriptures, as modeled in the early church, as modeled throughout church history. So what are we supposed to do? What is required of sheep towards their leaders? Show appreciation. Get to know them. Do you know the struggles that your leaders are going through? As a sheep, have you taken the time to reach out to to a leader and say, what's going on that I can pray for you? Have you done that? Have you practiced the one another commands to your leaders? That's exactly what Paul is telling these, these people. And he says, love one another. Bear one another's burdens. 
Pray for one another. Be with one another. The church of Jesus Christ is only as real as the individual Christians choose to be real. So the first thing then we're required as sheep to our leaders is show appreciation. Now, I, I, it, it is, it's a hard message because I don't want you to think, well, here he's talking about himself. I don't want you to look at it that way. I don't, I'm, I'm not attempting to do that. The text is about sheep to leaders. It just so happens to fit that I'm there. But regardless, this is, this is the real deal when it comes to sheep to leaders. Do you know the, one of the number one reasons why pastors lead their churches? It's not because of persecution outside. It's because of the discouragement of sheep within. That is one of the top five reasons why pastors look at their why and say, I don't need this. I thought they loved. I thought they cared. And so they jettison the whole thing, and they go out and do something else because of the discouragement and the weightiness of sheep placing upon them because they don't know them. They don't show appreciation because they don't know them. But there's something else. Look at verse uh, uh, 13. Here's the second Here's the second requirement of sheep to leaders if we're going to enjoy a harmony and a unity. Now, what I want, I want to re- reemphasize this. These are leaders that deserve this respect. They're not lazy. They're not self-serving. They're not lording it over. They're servant leaders as Christ would have them. They lead well by example. They protect the sheep. They sacrifice for the sheep. They expend themselves for the sheep. I'm not talking about lazy leaders who tell people to do something but never model what what they do. This respect to these sheep, by these sheep to the leaders, they are the sheep that observe their leaders and they're worthy of the respect. Here's the second thing. What is required of sheep towards their leaders? That they show special honor to their leaders. They show special honor I do want to give a warning, though, and it's a warning that, sadly, I have, I have done to myself too often. Do you know if you're critical towards a leader, or you're bitter towards a leader, or you gossip about a leader, or you want to be mean towards a leader, do you know who suffers the worst in that attitude? The person you look in the mirror I have been too quick at times to be critical of a leader, to not like what a leader does. And you know who it hurts? It hurt me. It deadens my relationship with the Lord Jesus. It robs me of joy. It robs me of peace. Why? Because it's not about me. And if you are tempted to do that for your own self-preservation and your own spiritual health, go slow because you will suffer. The Lord does not take lightly, you know, being unloving to his people and in particular to his leaders. But take a look then at verse 13. Here's the second requirement of sheep to leaders. Paul would say first, first respect them, appreciate them, know them. And then he would say, and esteem them, verse 13, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. The word or the phrase, esteem them very highly, it it denotes to hold them in the highest regard. To hold them in the highest regard. This is not false flattery. This is not walking up to your preacher after the the sermon and saying a, a good sermon and then walk away. This isn't flattery. This is a... This is an intentional reflection upon what they do. The word esteem, it's not a word of feeling. It is actually a word of thought. And it means to consider, to give thought to, to regard or to ponder. And what Paul was telling these Thessalonians, he says, think very highly Consider very highly what they do. Look at the verse, verse 13. Esteem them very highly 
in love. That's the how. That's the next thing we're going to look at. But notice the why. Because of their work. We are, we are to esteem our leaders to hold them in the highest regard because of their work. What this means is if you, if you feel tempted, if you feel tempted to be critical or tempted to look down upon a leader, you need to stop. And you need to think what they're called to do. Think about the demands that God has placed upon them. Oftentimes, it's not this lack of esteem or this lack of not uh, holding them up highly. Most of the time, it's not malicious. It's just we don't remember. We don't remember. And it's easy as a sheet to be to wonder, to drift. It's easy. And when it comes to esteeming our leaders as a sheep to hold them in the highest regard because of what they do, let me give you three things that you can do to help you obey this command to esteem leaders very highly. And the first one we've already harped on for the last 15 minutes, and that is get to know them. Spend time knowing your leaders, not as leaders first, but as Christians first. I may be your pastor but I'm a Christian first. Get to know your leaders as Christians. Get to know their lives. Get to know what they're going through. You're not the only one that has problems. You're not the only one facing trials and tribulations. Be very careful that you don't forget to show them honor and show them honor because of what Paul would say, because of their work. And here's the three things to do to help you and help me to understand. Number one, get to know them. Invest in building relational capital with them. But here's the criteria for you leaders. Make yourself knowable. Don't stand at a distance from the sheep. If they want to take you out to lunch, go. If they want to have you to dinner, go. If they just want to stop by and talk to see how you're doing, let them stop is don't be at this distance because then you're going to actually model something that you are preaching but you're not doing. Is I can't cry out to be transparent and be vulnerable and be real if I'm not willing to be transparent, vulnerable, and real. And so if you're going to honor them in their work, number one, get to know them. Get to know their struggles. Get to know, you know, what their life, their backgrounds. Get to know your leaders. Here's another one. Number two, you can do this to help you honor leaders in the sheep leader relationship. Get a really good book on what it means to be a pastor or an elder. Read a really good book, a biblical-based book on what it means to be a pastor or an elder. And if you need titles, I got a lot. It would be one of the most important things you ever do in your Christian life and your relationship with your leader if you read good, solid, biblical books by reputable pastors and theologians uh, telling you what is the life of a pastor or a leader. It It will transform how you look at that man. Read a good book on what it means. Gain insights what is required of them. Preaching, counseling, spiritual battles, the intensity and exhausting nature of their work. The third thing to do to help you obey the command to honor our leaders and thus maintain the harmonious relationship in our, in our church, not only get to know them, not only read a good book about what they're, they're called to do, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, take your shoes off and put his on for a week. In fact, is ask, uh, ask, to have a, ask to have a work week. Go to work with him for a week. John MacArthur once said, quote, God has called pastors and set them apart for the important work of leading his church. Therefore, the people under them are to lovingly acknowledge their ministry labors, greatly respect them, overlook, overlook their non-sinful human frailties, speak well of them, encourage them, give their best for them. So, that's the question. The first one is, what is required of us in our sheep leadership uh, relationships? We're required to show appreciation, get to know them. 
Number two, show special honor for their work's sake. Learn to see what they have to do. The heavy weight that God has placed upon them. Well, number two, here's the second question. Go back to verse 13. How are we to do these things? How are we supposed to respect, appreciate, know, and esteem our leaders? It's two words in verse 13. In love. In love. 1 Thessalonians 5, 13, 13, Paul says, and to esteem them very highly, to hold them in high regard for their work's sake, and do so in love. You're not going to hold them on high esteem um, very, very long if you don't love them. Because when you lack love for someone, your default is going to be to find faults in them. Is that if you don't love someone, you may just gut it out in the strength of your personal resolve, but eventually you're going to find something wrong with that person. And you're going to look down on that person for their fault. And if you look at a leader, if you look at leaders, leaders in our church, it won't take you very long to find fault. It won't take you very long. Why? Because they are sinners redeemed like everybody else. But there's a difference between faults and disqualifying sin. And I'm not saying give the, give the leader a pass on disqualifying sin. And the lofty requirements uh, we hold very dearly. And if any of your leaders are disqualified, you wouldn't have to pull it out. Because if our leaders are disqualified because they're men of integrity and men of, uh, of biblical integrity, those men will step aside by themselves. That's the kind of men God has given us. But when you look at how to handle your leaders. If you don't do it in love, you're going to find a chink in them pretty quickly. And this will be tested. And this will be tested. Why? As I mentioned, leaders are not perfect. Leaders fail. Leaders disappoint. And how you respond to a disappointing leader will say a lot about your personal walk with the Lord Jesus. Because if you're quick to write a leader off, or if you're quick to be critical towards a leader, or you're quick to, you know, just be so disappointed that you just polarize your relationship, if you're quick to do that, you have forgotten how God deals with you. You have forgotten the forgiveness that's in Christ. You have forgotten the patience of God with you in your failings. And we become more like Pharisees than we do Christians. So the question is, how do you respect and esteem your leaders even though they fall? Even though they may not meet up your expectations? Well, here's something you've got to be careful with. Make sure that your expectations on your leaders are biblical. It's too often that people will place an expectation upon a leader that is not their calling. And you're going to see here what the primary calling is of the pastor. The primary calling is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. My primary calling is not to make you feel good. My primary calling is to make you equipped to do the work of the ministry. And we miss that sometimes. We place too much expectation on our leaders that may be outside of the boundaries of what God expects of them. And if you place that on your leaders, then you've just lit the fire of discouragement that may very well drive them out. Because I, I will tell you straight up, and this is personal here, I can't meet your expectations. And if you are requiring me to do that, then I'm the guy that needs to walk away too. Because sometimes our expectations on each other's is way too high. And I'm not diminishing the biblical requirements but let's be careful that what I expect of my leader is what God expects of my leader. But here's the test. Here's the test. How do you know if you and I are esteeming our leaders and respecting them, knowing them in love? It's what we're studying on Sunday nights, 1 Corinthians 13. Is this how you look at your leader? Is this how you treat your leader, fellow sheep? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 
It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's the cement of relationships between sheep and leaders, and leaders and sheep. When love controls sheep, and love controls leaders, we create in the church of Jesus Christ a place where the welfare and interests of others is practice, where forgiveness occurs quickly and thoroughly, where love covers a multitude of sin, where genuine affection is shared, and where the supremacy of the Lord Jesus is the governing passion. How effective would that be in a world? We would need a new building because the world out there is looking for what? They're looking for someone to care about them. They're looking for forgiveness. They're looking for deliverance from the bondage of themselves. They're looking for genuine affection. And little do they know it, but they're screaming for the supremacy of God in their lives. Can you imagine if the church did that? This place would be overflowing, not because we're seeker sensitive and trying to make sinners feel good. It would be overflowing because genuine Christianity would be practiced among us to where we love and we love with patience and kindness and bearing all things and believing all things and hoping all things and leaders are encouraged and sheep are encouraged and harmony exists and the gospel spreads. It's not hard. God has not made our instructions hard. Do you know what makes life hard? Sin makes life hard. Selfishness makes life complex. So Paul's instruction to the Thessalonians, and they were already doing these things. He says, this is what's required of you, sheep, to your leaders. Show them appreciation. Know them. Honor them. Esteem them because of their work. And how do you do this? And how do you continue to do this? By the power of Christ's love. And friends, you can't can't manufacture that. You can't love people. You can't love people as Christ would have us and in Christ's love. You can't manufacture that. You can't grin and uh, and grin and uh, and bite your tongue and hold your tongue and say, I'm just going to love this person. You can't do that. This is a natural outflow of your relationship with God. And like I said, that if you want to be that way towards a leader in an unloving way, then it is an indictment upon your walk with the Lord, not the leader. Now, how is this love, how is this love shown in, in, in an actual relationship? I want you to look at Acts chapter 20. There's a very a wonderful picture of how this love of sheep to, to leaders is portrayed with Paul and the Ephesians. Acts chapter 20, verse 36. I want you to look at this picture. We already identified that when the church of Jesus Christ is biblical, there'll be this transparency, there'll be this sincerity, there'll be this commitment to family, there'll be affection, there'll be sharing, there'll be knowing, uh, there'll be life on life. Look at verse 36, and I want you to see the picture. Just imagine being there and watching this. Now, Paul had been with them over two years. His love for these people were mutual. He had fleshed that out by teaching them day and night. He was in their lives. They knew that he loved them, and he's getting ready to leave. And when Paul had said these things, again, picture yourself along the side watching this. He knelt down and prayed with them all. As you're walking by and you saw this scene, you see a a bunch of people they all kneeling down and they're praying with each other. And there was much weeping on the part of them, on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and kissed him. Now you're standing at a side and you're looking and you're seeing this little praying group. And by the way, if you want to safeguard your relationships with leaders and you want to safeguard your relationship with sheep to sheep and you want to deepen your relationship, the most important thing you can do is pray with them consistently pray with them. You will not be able to harbor anything against someone that you commit to pray with, if you're going to be real. But look what happens. So they're praying together. Now there's much weeping. So we're standing here, we're watching this, and now we're hearing and, and seeing these tears flow from these people. And then we see this lone little guy, the Apostle Paul. They're all getting up, and they're going around this little guy, and he wasn't a big guy. And they're all around the Apostle Paul, and they're hugging him. 
and they're showing affection to him. Being sorrowful. Being sorrowful. Why were they sorrowful? Look at verse 38. Because they wouldn't see him anymore. This is a nice snapshot of good sheep leader relationship. Affection. Prayer. Sincerity. Just a oneness that just, it, it, makes you, it makes you yearn. It should make you yearn that that's what I want in my church. That's what I want in my life. Because that's real. That's the Bible definition of Christianity. All right, quickly, we're going to finish it up here. Here's the third one. Go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.13. Here's the third question. The first one is, what is required? Show appreciation, show special honor. Second question, how are we supposed to do that? In love, Christ's love that sustains it. And number three, why are we to do this? Well, first and foremost, it's a command. God has told us, if you love me, don't sing, I love you, Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so the measurement of our obedience is a measurement of our love to Christ. And so these are commands. But the thing about these commands is if you're healthy and leadership is healthy... These are commands that you look at and say, I get to do this. I don't have to. It's not a burdensome. Remember 1 John says, his commands are not burdensome. If you find the commands of God burdensome in your life, something's wrong. He says the commands are not burdensome. These become commands of delight. I want to esteem my leaders. I want to show them love. And the answer to the question is twofold. Is twofold. He says, and it's seen the very highly in love because of their work. It's the last uh, scripture I'm going to share with you. But look at Ephesians chapter 4. And I mentioned this earlier. This is the primary role of your spiritual leaders in the church. And make sure that in your understanding of what the leaders are supposed to do. Now, there's other things they're supposed to do. But make sure that if your leader is not doing what you want him to do, make sure that you understand that this is their primary job. This is their primary calling from God. And you esteem them because of this. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and pastors and teachers. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Or to train them for the work of the ministry. For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. The number one role of your spiritual leaders is to mature you in Christ. So that in verse 14, that you won't be gobbled up in a godless world. That you will be able to not be tossed to and fro by false doctrine. And then verse 15. That in your maturity and in your stability in a world gone mad, you will be able to grow up in Christ, in love, so that the church can be the church. And so why do you love your leaders? Because their work is instrumental in your growth. God has ordained that he has given gifts to the church. You all have a spiritual gift if you're a Christian. But he has given the gift of pastors and teachers to the church. Do you see your leaders as that? They are God's gift to the church to mature you so that you can do the work of the ministry. So that's our first answer to the why question. Why do you esteem them in love? Because God's given them to you so that you will grow spiritually. The second reason why we are to respect and esteem our leaders in love It's because of their responsibility before the Lord. Very few weeks go by that I don't shake at this verse. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Your leaders are going to stand before the Lord Jesus and give an account for your soul. That should allow you as a sheep or motivate you as a sheep to make our job easy. Don't be a difficult sheep. Don't be a sheep that has to give sheep bites to the leaders. Be the type of sheep that makes their job, because Hebrews 13, 17 goes on to say, as those who have to give an account, let them do this with joy. 
Let them lead with joy. Let them lead not with groaning. Don't be a type of sheep when a leader sees you that they want to go the other way. Be the type of sheep that you encourage, you love, you hold in high esteem because of their work's sake. And when the writer of Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit to them, this is not a conditional obedience. And if you understand the church, the family, and the relationships we just talked about, you don't get to pick and choose obedience. If you don't like a decision a leader makes, that doesn't give you the right to cause division. And if you don't like a direction that a leader's going, I'm not talking about unbiblical and, and poor theology and all that, but if you don't like a direction a leader's going, that doesn't give you a right to say, I'm out of here. Because how many times in your physical family have you had disagreements? Maybe none of you. Maybe in your family, you're, you never have disagreements. You never have any, anything that rubs you wrong. Well, when that happens, how many times have you looked at your family and says, I don't like that, and so I'm leaving. I told Joy, if she ever left me, I'm going with her. <laughs> the call of sheep to leader is to obey them and submit to them. And if they're worthy leaders, you want to do that. Because they're equipping you to mature in Christ so that you can be a loving body and the world will take notice that we have been with Jesus. So sheep responsibilities, we have them. I'm not going to review them again. Pray about it and ask yourself, are you a sheep that's bringing joy to your leaders because you're doing these things? And then leaders, ask yourself, are you a leader that labors hard, that leads well, and that loves thoroughly? Well, Lord willing, next week we'll pick it up in verse 13 and 15, and we're going to look at our relationships with one another. Sheep on sheep, because that's what he's talking about, is it be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, and we're going to see four or five responsibilities we have to each other as being sheep together in the Lord's pasture. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.